welcome. Um, so you're here for the emerging role of BI in the in your organization. We got a fantastic panel up here of some people, professionals in the world of BI. Some of them are faces you know, some of them are faces you may not. But by it's all by the time we're done, hopefully you'll have some information to take back and make things happen. Um, thank you for showing up. Uh, one thing I like to make sure happens is that we silence cell phones, please. Um, you know, it's just like a theater. We don't want popcorn being tossed or anything like that. We want to make sure everyone has a good time and ability to hear without distractions. So please silence your cell phones. Again, we have all kinds of things to pass. Uh, everything up there from free online webinar events, local users, one day training, get involved. Obviously, you're here, which is a good thing. But just remember, there's more than just attending. You can take part and some, at some point make your way up here. So let's go through introductions. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure the individuals have the opportunity to introduce themselves. So we'll start with Ginger. Hi, I'm Ginger Grant. I'm a independent consultant and um, Microsoft Data Platform MVP and certified trainer. I do a lot with advanced analytics and, of uh, course, a lot with Power BI. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to read the slide then. But my name is Jonathan Stewart, and no, I'm Jonathan Stewart. I am a business intelligence developer. I've been dealing with SQL Server since it was Sybase. So way, 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 way back in the day. It's Okay, is this better? There you go. Do I sound better when I talk like this? No. So I've been dealing with SQL Server since Sybase uh, 4.2, SQL Server, Sybase SQL Server 4.2. And uh, it's amazing what you can do when you're like nine years old, because I'm only like 27 now. But uh, <laughs> business intelligence since DTS way back in the day. I am an avid scuba diver. Is anybody scuba dive? All right. I'm actually diving a Puget Sound Saturday morning. Seriously. Um, and I'm a hobbyist photographer. And I am one of the founding members of the Patrick LeBlanc fan club. So. Um, Patrick LeBlanc, I'm a principal programmer on the, <laughs> on the Power BI customer advisory team, um, and that's about it. And my name is Reed Havens. Um, in a similar field to Ginger Grant, uh, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, uh, overall data architect, and um, I would say like uh, definitely like visual design enthusiast. Typically, a lot of stuff um, with aesthetics and other things are kind of like my specialty, and where I have fun with the, the BI space these days. Um, and I also teach part time at the University of Washington. Um, I've actually, like found that one of my favorite things and passions in life is like I love to build reports, but it's really cool to be able to hang out in a room with people who are just engaged and eager to want to like learn software and then leave just like this is going to change my work environment. Like, this is amazing. Thank you so much. So, like, yeah, like, just interactions with people are kind of um, the things that I get most out of. And I'm Warren Stephen, a principal solutions consultant. Um, been dealing with data for over 20 years and been basically played every role in the book. I've uh, been doing BI for the last six, seven years and kind of just been dealing with this transition that organizations have been having in going from the traditional IT business interactions with reports and analytics and trying to get more modern and kind of work the way through. And I think um, that's kind of what this panel's here for, is to kind of figure out how, help you guys figure out how that works. Um, so I guess by a show of hands, how many of you in this room are in organizations that are actually dealing with BI and actually in, in initiatives? Seriously, not everybody? I mean, I figure everybody would be, on, be doing that. So uh, one of the things I like to figure out is how many of you have something established that you're proud of that you think is functional, it's amazing, and doesn't need any tweaking whatsoever? <laughs> awesome. So those of you that did not raise your hands, we expect questions from you all session long because you must have must need some help, and that's what we're here for, right? We're here to talk about some of the things that are out there. Um, so I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask the first question. Who's going to raise the first hand? Of course, usual. Yes. Yeah. 
So the question, for if, if I understood it correctly, is that quarterly updates, there's some overlap that takes place. How do we manage that? And how is that, how do we make it to where it's operational and reduce the overhead that it takes to do these quarterly snapshots and reduce the duplication of data potentially that happens with some of the overlaps? So honestly, it depends. So I, I hate to give you the consultant answer. But it, it absolutely depends on how you're trying to snapshot, what you're trying to snapshot. You know, if we're talking about, if, if, I'm th if I think about snapshot and, and I think about um, data warehouse design, like just data modeling 101, the first thing I think about is how I do my dimensions. Is it a type zero, type one, type two? Because that'll maintain how those looks from a snapshot perspective. If we're talking about facts, right, if we're talking about additive, semi-additive values, that's a different thing. And you may need to maintain a different table to hold those snapshots and have some type of version or time period or something on it to, to balance it that way. Otherwise, it's not something that's intuitive or baked into most of the in-memory products. So. All right. We'll use this. You guys will use that? Yeah, we'll use this. Sounds good. Next question. Yes, sir. The question is, is what are some of the challenges in making the transition? Was that? Okay. Uh, making the transition from coming from these traditional SSRS centralized environment and making your way through the more modern architectures that are in play. The biggest thing I think when you're working between um, migrating from SSRS to Power BI is actually your users um, because they're not used to um, clicky, clicky, draggy, draggy at all. But so they, they just want all the data. And generally they want all the data so they can dump it into Excel. But the idea is, is, to, is to try sh to show value in a visualization. And one of the things that I do, um, I work with a lot of clients that have a lot of reporting in Excel. And they are migrating to Power BI. And one thing that I, that I do with them to try to get them to more engaged in a visual environment is I put up um, on one of those Excel spreadsheets that everyone's got lying around, and then I have it up on a, on a um, presentation screen for like 10 seconds. And then I shut it down and say, okay, now which, which division had the highest numbers? And then I put up a bar chart and put, give that up for five seconds and shut it and say, okay, which division had the fi highest numbers? And there's only one of those where people are able to have the answer. And there's gonna be some user training in, involved as well because they need to know that they this is a good thing. This isn't you're making me click on stuff. This is you're providing them the ability to drive the analysis that they want to look at through the visualizations that they're offering. So it's a, it's a really big user training thing more than anything else. One of the things I like to add to that is that I don't think there's a either or. You got to use one, get rid of the other. I think what needs to happen as part of this transition where you start introducing visualizations is providing that guidance that says, you know what, this type of report that you're looking for needs to be in this tool, right? You're not gonna use Power BI and show a list of a million records. Hey, here's all the people that bought a red cell phone. You would not do that in Power BI unless you want a grand total or some kind of breakdown or slice or some kind of grouping or binning or something like that, but not just a long list. So you, I don't think you'll ever get away from the traditional SSRS, but coming up with the guidelines of what tool do you use when? You want to take that? I can take that. <laughs> so I'm 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 currently involved with a client right now where we're actually going through that process right now where we're um, basically we're getting some SSRS stuff that's on prem. They've got a premium capacity. They want to put things up on this on on uh, the, the Power BI service through the premium capacity. And feature-wise, it seems to work very well. I mean, it's the transition is there. Uh, the paginated report builder is very much I, almost identical to the T, with the exception of a few different colors, um, and some right-click options that are different. But as far as the interface of building things and everything else, it seems to work just fine. So getting things across, I think it's, 
fairly seamless. You just need to make sure you have your workspaces configured, you have your, your, your gateways, and everything else that you've had in the past. So we have a migration tool. If you're coming from on-premises, going to paginated reports, and tomorrow at 1.30, I'm gonna show you how to use that tool. So you can point it to a folder or a report in, on your report server, and it'll download the RDL file, validate it to make sure that it meets all the requirements of paginated reports, like sub-reports. We don't sub support sub-reports, so if you have a sub-report in it, you'll get an exception report, and it'll just identify all those that can't be migrated, and the ones that can, it'll just upload them to the workspace that you identify. So, yeah. Can I talk? <laughs> yes, sure. you can. No, um, so it's one of those things where you got to identify what your what your uh, your use case actually is, right? Because at the end of the day, Excel still has legit purposes too. Excel is never going away. It will always be the most used BI tool on the planet, right? So there's certain things that Power BI can't. Power BI would never be a pick list tool, right? That's a paginated report coming out of reporting services, right? You're never going to have somebody in, in a warehouse running a, P, a Power BI report for a pick list. <laughs> Maybe, okay, maybe. But those are usually paginated reports, you know, on and on and on and on and stuff like that. So it's always about, you know, what's the proper tool for such and such, right? What's the proper tool for this visualization? So you're going to sit and think about what, what do you use the most? Like, there is no one, I know a lot of people want a, want a, one, a one tool to do everything, you know, the one tool to rule them all type of thing. But think of it as the one company's suite to rule them all. Everything has a specific purpose, right? If you're making a report, that you're gonna to give to uh, a board, board members and CEOs, that's, that's PowerPoint. PowerPoint's not going away specifically for that, right? You may design some of the things in Power BI, in Excel, but it's still gonna be you know, used for that type of thing. So you gotta identify what your actual end goal and your use case is for the tool and then pick the tool for that. Yes. Pull together some of the IT with uh, the power users or the Excel super users. So to paraphrase the question, basically we're trying to figure out how do we get users that are currently doing their own BI analytics in an IT department that's overworked, overtaxed, and how do we get them to where they're able to work in unison and not have the this proverbial shadow IT that takes place with them developing solutions in Excel or any other tool that is not necessarily either sanctioned or not following process or compliance or whatever is established within the IT organization that's there. Yeah, so I think a lot of this actually comes um, with quite a few of the new features that have been coming um, out for both Power BI Pro and Premium in the last few years. Um, one of the ones now that's three, four years old um, is Analyze in Excel. That's a, an amazing tool to be able to connect to shared data sets. Um, and I think that there's a way to kind of have your cake and eat it too in a lot of these scenarios where um, the goal is to really you know, create those golden data sets, the, the, the sources of data that has the single source of truth where people can connect to them in PBI, Power BI desktop files, people can connect to them in Excel, they can still do ad hoc reporting off of it, they can make a pivot table however they want to, uh, you know, have at it with cube values and make um, all sorts of unique um, accounting reports from it. But the data is still gonna match as far as that goes. Um, and even in Power BI we have um, you know, the ability to connect to, to tabular models um, in published to Power BI and still have the option to add measures against it. So if 
Um, if the, the course uh, set in um, from IT being provided is actuals minus budget, but some manager wants it to be budget minus actuals for a reason, you can write that measure and have that in the model. Maybe further down, have a conversation with central IT to say, hey, is this something that could be used across the system? But it's still going to be using the same set of core data. So there, there's, there's a way to have these you know, um, fragmented reports that people can build as, as much as necessary for ad hoc reporting, which is what we want to enable. Um, but it, it's still using that core foundational set of shared data sets, and nowadays also even data flows that can also um, be certified and everything. So all of that kind of locks down a bit um, the data and possibly even the transformations and you know any of those columns that have identifiers in them um, in terms of categories and stuff. Uh, but um, then just you know opening them up to um, allowing these kind of reports just to exist in that um, spoke and wheel kind of scenario. And so to piggyback on what, what Reed was saying too. Is, is you got to get you got to get both sides to buy in because IT is never going to never going to let go of security right and, and that's where it should be at but on the flip side the business doesn't want that responsibility so if you get them to understand that hey you know what IT is going to secure this for you but you can build it because at the end of the day IT doesn't have time to build these multiple things too so when you see that it's it's a win win right and that's you know we we've, we've all grown up in the whole you know us versus them type of mentality. When you get them both to understand and buy in that this is a team thing, and right, you're the offense, we're the defense, or vice versa, right? At the end of the day, we need both to win, and you have true buy-in from both sides. Then you have, oh, okay, yeah, the business is going to build these off of these data sets that have been built by IT. These have been built, these have been certified, pushed. Hey, now pick and choose, do your thing, right? And so once you get that that nice zen balance between the two, then you get them to understand stuff like that. So that's. I'll back that up as well, because that's something that uh, comes up a lot, is what are the boundaries, right? Do you want IT to be your BI resource? Do you want IT to be the BI developers? Do you want IT to control all these things? And that's been what the idea has been over the last 15, 20 years that the reporting has been around, is that IT does everything technical, and the business throws something over the fence, and hopefully there's a long, not a long queue, and they're not waiting all day for it. So there is this, this idea, this proliferation of self-service that we need to build some governance around, and some organizations are very hesitant to enable that or allow that to be something they, they evangelize because of the Wild Wild West theory, this thing of I don't want my dis databases destroyed. I don't want everybody building the same report, just slightly different colors. Um, so that's where you gotta come up with this process. You gotta come up with this, the means of being able to identify and articulate what are the different roles that are being played by the business as well as by the IT and have everyone understand that there is this IT strategy that requires both sides to make it work, right? The business wants to run at their pace. You gotta let them. If we don't, they're going to do their own thing. And now we've got to unravel that every few years. It's going to be unraveled, whether it be Microsoft Access, whether it be Excel, whether it be some of the tool, right? Everything you take away, someone will put back in. Someone will fill in the blank. If the core issue is not handled, whether it be the responsibility distribution between the departments and IT and what that relationship looks like. Um, so anyhow, I'm very passionate about this. There's a question over there. Year two, so one. This is maybe a good follow-up follow to that last one because for about the last year, what we've been doing is really identifying those Excel or whatever power users, giving them a lot of access in Power BI to do their own modeling, either in desktop, Power <coughs> Pivot, you name it. But now the follow-up challenge I'm trying to figure out or looking for help on is applying some kind of change management. So now that they've realized the value of developing those things, now they need help refactoring a data set which already has a number of reports and apps built on it and kind of coordinating the release and the QA of that. And it's, I have no idea what to do. That right there is all about process, right? When you are, when you let them loose and you identify these people and you give them the opportunity to build these things that they've been wanting to build and I can do it for real now, I'm not gonna, I don't have to do it in the back closet in the basement, hide it and I can actually show it to people. This is amazing. They're happy, they're, they're motivated. But you've got to have a way to be able to control the promotion of that, right? And not promotion in the sense of everybody can do it, but promotion from a departmental standalone solution that I built in Power BI, a model that's here, to something that's more server-based, controlled, access, available, to the, towards what was mentioned earlier about the source of truth.
So I, I guess it's a matter of where you want to land that responsibility. If they're developing it, then you would think they would be the one that would QA it. Yeah, so like to Patrick's thing, there are some things that are coming. Um, but today, honestly, like at a, at a very simple level, it's, just, you know, it's essentially how do you have a dev and, and production environment um, between pushing out features, especially for shared data sets. Um, I'll also make a, um, a slight mention at this point of it would be great if there was some documentation on showing what changes in the model will actually break those shared data sets for reports connected to it. As an example, a measure. If you move it between tables, that measure no longer works. If you put the measure in a group in said table, um, it will still work. So there's certain metadata changes you can make that will um, work and some aren't. Unfortunately, there's not a, I've not found a, just a great list of like the do's and don'ts of that. You kind of have to test it back and forth. Um, a really good practice of mine is the, typically, you know, you have the model that's disconnected. There's no actual report pages. A bunch of things that can, are connected to this. Um, the, the, when they added to this about a year and a half ago, um, you, you can copy and paste visuals between the report files. So a great way to just quickly test, so let's say you have five reports, um, open up those uh, connected reports, you know, control A to select all of them, paste it into the data model, and if there's a single thing that was broken, that visual will immediately break and you can identify, oh, this column got changed. So that's a quick way within five minutes that I can test all the connected reports without actually having to publish, refresh all the other connected things and see if anything broke there, um, potentially in that. So one avenue that's at least the best practice that I can do today with that. Um, the other one is uh, doing development and production. Um, honestly, with, with workspaces and apps, um, I publish two versions of every single uh, report into there. One, we just underscore dev, and the other one, production. And what you can do is, you know, basically test out first to the dev versions, um, and then as soon as you have that, um, have confirmed that, tested it, uh, vetted it, that uh, basically just becomes the production version that you overwrite, and those production versions are the ones that actually show up in the apps, because you can choose which ones to publish to the app. So you might have 20 reports, 10, un uh, 10 unique ones, each with a dev and production version, but only the, the 10 actual production ones are the ones that show up in the apps, which are shared with the users. Um, there will be some better methods for that, managing it in the future, but that's the most effective solution that I've found that I implement with any of the projects that I do to make sure that nothing breaks by the time it reaches the execs or anything else. So, my company's recently been going through trying to consolidate sources of truth so that everybody who's doing analysis is entering through a semantic layer. And we've seen success with that, and it's promoted some self-service BI adoption. And it's, we've seen some gains from that. At the same time, we've noticed it's become more difficult to validate the results that our analysts come out to versus the results that some of our applications that our BI delivery mechanisms as well are coming out to, especially in any reasonable way. And a great example is we deploy a new version of an application. This application has maybe some of the analytics are embedded Power BI tiles or reports. Maybe some of them are just using front-end JavaScript libraries to quickly visualize something because they don't want to load the entire model. Essentially, we've noticed that now with the introduction of a semantic layer, it's getting harder to tie the work that individuals are doing to the work that's being programmatically done by applications. And in this desire in corporate America right now for one source of truth, what is the general pattern that people use to make sure that if an application's coming to a result and your analysts or some self-service BI mechanism are coming to a result, that we're keeping those results synced? It depends. <laughs> it, it really does depend on the, so whenever I think about, you know, I'm creating a report or building, doing some type of analytics, it's not about, <clears throat> it's not about that given department or that given application. It's what I'm trying to do, right? And so I go and talk to the, let's say all you guys are my end users, I gotta talk to these people and say, all right, look, we got a new application that's out. Um, you want this report, why? Why do you want that report? And then it's likely I can find a place that that new data fits into the repository that we already have. Um, we may already have a data warehouse that we're using in our organization, and if this new application is not part of the data warehouse, but it's gonna be mingled with additional metrics and dimensions and things that we already use, it's likely that that should become part of our central repository, add it to that data warehouse, our semantic model is updated, and then all of our reports are continued to create against, we continue to create them against that same repository. So, but I think somebody said it before, it's a matter of process. You know, it's a matter of process and governance that 
that I don't think any, any of the companies that I've worked with, and I work with some of the largest companies in the world, have implemented besides one company in South Africa, yeah. um, Standard Bank, they have a formalized governance process. To get a Power BI license, you have to pass a test, mm -hmm. right? To get on their premium, they have two different environments. They have a, what they call the production environment and the enterprise environment. The, the, enterprise, the production environment is the Wild Wild West. That's what they call it, right? You can do whatever you want in it. The enterprise environment, there's a separate gateway. You have to put in a request to get the gateway, to get, to get a data source on the gateway. You have to put in a request to create a workspace that's backed by premium capacity, okay? If I want a pro license and I want to become a pro user, there's a power app that they created. Before you can get to the link, you have to pass the test. Everyone passes the test, right? Everyone passes the test. But if I pass the test, right, this is a little more important to me. Right, it adds like, I, I'm owning up to this. If I pass the test, then I get the pro license. It's likely that I'm gonna do great things with it if you just gave it to me, right? Things for free, we don't always respect those things for free, right? And so it's all about the process that you implement in your organization. Instead of just having the wild, wild west, and it goes to every question I think that's been asked so far is, you, you as an organization have to make a, a decision at the beginning or at the end, at some point, What's the balance is gonna be between enterprise business intelligence and self-service? Because if IT governance too much, you're not creating a data culture and nobody's gonna use your data. If it's the wild, wild west, if it's completely self-service, you're gonna send out a report that has the wrong numbers and then somebody's gonna lose their job, probably you, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, I'll get back to my soapbox. So. And so and on that too, and, and add with that too, one of the things too, if you have, if you have standard data source, data sets, and if people are building reports off of them and the numbers are becoming different, your business logic is probably not in that centralized source either. You gotta centralize your business logic. That's the only way you're getting different numbers from the same data set because somebody's adding calculations outside of that. If those are calculations that they need, then that needs to be centralized as well. So that's, once again, that's a process type of problem, so. I actually worked for a company that they were very, they wanted to ensure that the finance people had total buy-off on Power BI. So one of the things that we had to do is we had to write for every single DAX calculation the business calculation for it. So if it was, you know, sum of days minus, you know, whatever divided by whatever, we had to write that down. And we actually created a page in a Power BI report that was nothing but a glossary of all the DAX transactions that we were used to make critical business calculations. And if accounting said, well, that's wrong, like, well, give us the business reason, the business calculation that you're using. So, but, and we wrote them all down as business, you know, like this source comes from this, day, this, um, this application and we divide it by this and times it by that. And we had to do that for all the DAX. And yes, it was a lot of work, but total buy off. Goes back the process. Oh, go ahead. We'll, we'll go with you. You got the mic, and then we'll go to you. Hey, my name is Sekou Tyler, and uh, my question is, as a BI developer, do you think it's valuable um, to put a lot of time into learning Python or R? No, I was not So, completely biased. So, no, really, this is, this is Patrick's answer. It depends, right? Because Patrick, if you, if you know Patrick, you've seen, Patrick hates code. Patrick literally, and, but he, obviously he's a successful BI developer, right? And so it's one of those things where, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna get more into AI and type of stuff like that or predictive analytics? Then yeah, you probably need to learn you know, some type of language like that. If you don't wanna do stuff like that, if you wanna do more back-end type of things, that's what's cool about the business intelligence field. There's so much in it, right? You can specialize in visualization. I don't know anybody who does that, but you know. <laughs> But no, so I mean, you can literally, it's, it's, it's just wide across the board. You can do, you can be an ETL developer and still be in BI. You can be, I mean, there's so many different things. You can performance tune in BI and never learn a language and stuff too. So all of those are BI developers. It depends on what you want to focus in. What do you want to see yourself doing? What do you like doing? Do you know, do you like code? Do you like to learn code? So, you know, obviously I know you know Ryan Wade. Ryan is a huge advocate of R because that's what he does and he likes to do stuff like that. So it depends on, what do you want to do with it? So for us to tell you yes or no, that's our bias behind it, right? So for me, I'm a, yeah, if you need to do it, I'll learn it, right? Patrick's a no, right? Ginger learned, has, see, she's a yes, we said she does R and Python, right? Reed does everything because he's a professor. So, you know, 
Warren actually does everything because Warren writes languages. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just quickly piggyback off of that. It's um, it, it, it is in a lot of ways, uh, and it depends. But the the way that I would describe it is, it's it's a tool that is there if you need it. Um, and it, it's to me, I would compare it to custom visuals or direct query, where there, there's a lot of things that are available as a feature of Power BI. But I think that people use just because it's there and it's a shiny new thing and like, oh, let's implement our visuals in Python. And like, all right, well, do you actually need this thing that you're looking at? And then a customer's staring at it for five minutes and they have no idea what the visual is actually telling them because sometimes it's too complex. So yes, if you're doing statistical or advanced calculations, um, either bo through data transformations or the display of visuals, um, there's a lot of options with Python and R. Um, and even some custom visuals you can get already prepackaged with the code in it. So you don't even need to have to engage with it. But just make sure that there's a very good reason to use those versus honestly, like simply is better with a lot of visuals. Like line and bar charts with good data still go a long way to, to, to telling a story. Um, so like that's kind of my two cents on it. I agree. I mean, at the, at, at the end of the day, when you're talking about R and Python and any other language that you're dealing with, it's, it's something that you're going to want to go into and do more of. Right? Are you going to become a data scientist? Is that your goal? Do you want to uh, play with data all day? And do you want not to be bound by licensing and be able to work at your pace in a way that allows you the freedom to showcase what you've done? Right? You know, one of the questions I get asked quite often is, hey, how do I get into BI? Right? And one of the beautiful things about BI, there's so much free stuff out there that you don't have to pay for to help you build a portfolio to say, you know what, these are my headshots. This is the work I've done. This is the code I've written. This is the visuals I've built. This is the Power BI. Here's the M language. Here's this. Here's that. That when you go to an interview or something like that, you'd be like, boom, there it is. Right? I may not have 10 years at some organization, but I've got all this experience and I've got all this stuff to back up that I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. Um, so it goes back to what do you want to do? Hi, uh, my name is Jason. I just wanted to add to the gentleman's question earlier of some of your responses. Um, so trying to understand when the app shows this value and how do you know the reports work. So I just want to say well, our, my team, we work with the financial department and all of our reports have a watermark. And so that way, if anyone that comes in and grabs our numbers and puts them on another report, let's say in Cognos or Power BI, if they don't have that watermark, it has not been validated. Similar to what Ginger was saying, these rules have been validated. So we do this watermarking as well as uh, themes within Power BI to know that the BI team for Hennepin County has deemed this valid. So just something to throw out there. Goes back to process. You establish a process using the tools that are available to you, whether it be watermarking, whether it be going through the promotion process of moving code from an individual Power BI desktop file to an analysis services cube that's already established, and you're re recreating that. And you need the documentation to provide you the definitions of those uh, calculations that are there and how they evolve over time. Because there's going to be questions, right? Not everyone reads those README files say, hey, this was updated last night. The calculation has changed. It's no longer multiplied by 0.1. It's by 0.12 now. Why is this number different? Well, guess what? You need to have that lineage that lets you know where the data is coming from, what's happening, where's the process ending up, and how to go about using it is how are you going to get that buy-in from those individuals and be able to work with IT and not skirt around it. Hi, my name is Andy. Um, we all know that there's lots of disciplines within BI, and as you're building a team, do you think it's better to have a team of a jack of all trades that knows a little bit about everything, or maybe a lot about everything, or is it better to have a team that's really got focused people that's, you know, that are gurus, that are experts in different pieces of kind of what you're doing? I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say it depends, <laughs> because that's the right answer. And, and it depends, what is the data maturity model of your organization? What are you trying to accomplish with this team, right? If all you're trying to do is diagnostic and, you know, and, and, and descriptive analytics, which is a traditional reporting, which some organizations are still trying to figure out how to do successfully, then your team will need a certain skill set. If your team is working on a project or working towards an initiative that deals more with the advanced side of things, right, it's more along the lines of predictive, advanced analytics and so forth, and dealing with some statistical analysis and so forth, then you're going to need a different skill set from that team. 
And that team would need to evolve as you move, as you progress through this maturity model of your organization's uh, you know, a journey through data, right? Hey, we got all this data, now what do we do with it? We got this data lake, now what do we do with it? We got this self-service tool, now what do we do with it, right? As we continue to acquire all these different levels of progression and maturity, your process has to follow and the skill sets would need to change as well. And as far as like the types of roles um, and like the, the the people that would be needed for this, um, if if you're to the point in where, where you're within the organization that you're not just simply testing a few reports and exploring to see whether or not you actually want to fully buy into Power BI, if you hit that spot where like yes, like over the, for the next six to twelve months we want to migrate reports to this, start implementing it, like the one thing that I've seen like that you need time and again that unfortunately isn't done very often is like a single at least a single architect, like somebody who actually is overseeing this, planning it out, like what goes to data flows, what goes to the shared data sets. Um, <clears throat> I've um, been hired by many companies where they often try to do this for a year and a half by themselves, two years, and then they end up with hundreds of reports, all imported models, um, all disconnected sets, and now they're like, oh, this is, it, it's spiraled out of control, we don't actually know what's being used anymore, we need to do like a full audit, and it costs them three times as much now to like wrangle this in, fix it, and set up a correct pipeline. So from day one, I think if, you, if a company is you know, doing more than just maybe a dozen or so reports and they're actually gonna have hundreds of users, like a good medium to uh, company up to enterprise, um, from day one having that point of an architect to make sure that things are mapped out and all those checks and balances are in place. Uh, and then more of you know, a team of junior developers to actually implement it, um, I think that's absolutely crucial um, to make sure that um, cost doesn't spiral out of control and then you end up with fragmented sets with different business logic and all these things where, why are our numbers 5% off? Like, well, there's a week's conversation to try to figure out where the data's coming from and all this because everybody's doing their old thing in a Wild West scenario. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I found myself in a BI role where I've become a jack of all trades and fairly familiar with various business processes in a business that has an, a large amount of exceptions, particulars, rules, and all sorts of problems as, in the system as well. And so anytime I get on a project, I keep getting torn away with one other issue or another, and I see other things going on where I can tell from a glance that either somebody, I overheard a conversation, I saw an email, where they have their facts wrong, and if they continue programming and going in the direction of that project, they're not gonna make a good product. But I'm already stretched so thin, I can't step in and provide my um, expertise on the matter, and my supervisors and leadership chain is already not necessarily managing the workload effectively across the whole organization. So how do you deal with the fact that uh, leadership just wants to throw as many people as they can, but those people may not have the skill set to do that particular task appropriately? The act of throwing bodies at a problem, and those bodies are just there to keep the room warm or be meat shields or whatever game or whatever thing you're doing, right? That doesn't solve any problems, right? That's just an expense. All you're doing is figuring stuff out. Um, you being in this position that you're in, I would say you'd have to pick your battles. You'd have to figure out, all right, of all these conversations that you're overhearing that you would love to interject, you would love to direct and provide some guidance, which one of those are gonna affect you? Which one of those you know are gonna turn right back around and say, hey, you know what, can you help fix this six months down the road? If you have that kind of foresight and you know that's coming and you know it's gonna to come to you, step up. If not, now you got a decision to make. If you're stretched, you're already doing your 50 hours a week, right? Because that's what's expected of the American culture nowadays. Um, guess what? Uh, that 50.2 that you're about to do, uh-uh. It's not going to affect me. Leave it alone. At the end of the day, organizations will continuously ask you to do more and more and more with less. And what needs to happen at some point is that as long as you continue to abide and oblige them of that, they will not feel the pain of needing to acquire people. Now, the moment that happens, they feel, oh, just get some bodies. And that's where the skill set comes in. That's where understanding where you're at in the maturity model, what you're trying to do, where you're trying to accomplish, what is the architecture you're trying to achieve that's been established by the professionals that have come in and provide that, where is it going, right? And unfortunately, to your point, it is a leadership question. It is a leadership problem. And it's something that leaders in this room are probably thinking to themselves, all right, do I have this? How do I address this? Where does it go? And that's where we're here to help, right? The professionals on this table are here to help with those things, whether it be passively or actively. Uh, no, I'm 
no, that, that is a great answer. And one more thing about that too, on that, you know, like, like Warren said, you have, a, you have a decision to make. But in that, there's still an opportunity there. If your company's really willing to throw bodies at something, that's an opportunity for you, especially with BI is still, like, it's emerging, right? It's still literally growing. So you could say, hey, you know what? I see all of these things going on here. Let me lead this. This is an opportunity for you to step up in a leadership role, right? It grows your career as well, right? And then the other option is obviously you could leave, right? That's a, <laughs> you know, I don't, you know, nobody wants to say that. But no, seriously, this is, option, this is an opportunity for you to become an architect, a manager, or something like that too. If they're willing to hire people, that's, that, that's cool. But now you can step up and lead and say, hey, you know what, I see this, I see this here. You can put your vision and your direction in it. And then if you can fix things, that says so much more about you. You have the respect of your company and you've grown your career. Now you're a manager level of stuff instead of just being you know, the worker bee who gets stuff thrown on, on you. You can decide where your, your career goes and stuff. So use it as an opportunity. Don't think of it as a, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, right? Now if they don't listen to you in that aspect, then you really have a decision to make. But for now, I would, I would use this as an opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I see these things happen, I don't have time to do this. Let me lead and you can have other people do the stuff that I'm doing day to day. Let me guide, so. Perspective shift. Whenever you find yourself boxed in, you're like, oh my God, what the heck am I gonna do now? This sucks, I'm in a position, I can't stand this. I hate this, he's irritating me, she's irritating me, this is this, this is that. Step back, figure out why is it bothering you so much? Figure out why is this individual, why is this event, why is it happening in the first place? And how can you affect the why or the how or the things that's causing that irritation to begin with? And see if there's a way you can get to root cause. And those are the opportunities that are being mentioned here. Hey, my name is Matt. Uh, I had a question about if you have a healthy BI atmosphere at work and you're acquired and the acquiring company is let's just say crusty and old and doesn't want to do any of the stuff that you're doing, how can you continue the work that you're doing without becoming that guy or that the person who is constantly wanting to do the stuff that you were doing before, but they don't think that that's a good idea or that's not the direction that they want to go in? So I found myself multiple times in that position. I tend to leave. I give them, I give them six to 18 months if in six to 18 months they haven't figured out what they have here, that the direction we were going, I mean, there's a reason they bought you, right? There's a reason they bought the company. What's that reason? And are you part of that reason? If you're not part of that reason and they're doing what they're doing and they don't see the light, they don't understand what's going on so far, or they're not including you in their vision, because at the end of the day, the, the, the path that you were going down might have felt great, wonderful, it's exciting, it's new, I'm, like, I'm, I'm motivated to do it. That's and then awesome. someone comes in and says, uh-uh, we're not doing that. And you might feel like, okay, this sucks. But if you understood their vision, you understood why they put the brakes, where they're going next, included you in those conversations, in that path, in that roadmap, and that roadmap looks like something you want to do, give it a chance. Well, the roadmap is Oracle Cloud. You know what, do you want to be an Oracle DBA? No. Then you've got a decision to make. Yeah. It's just, let's just call it what it is. Anybody else? No, no. no. <laughs> hey, I'm, my name's Brady. Um, where do you guys think like a data catalog falls into the importance of, uh, of a BI practice? Anything about the data catalog? Warren can do it. We have a guest speaker. So the you're talking about the data catalog that we released. Um, is that what you're talking about, or your own data catalog? A, a, gener a place to, for for the business. Oh, sorry. A place for the business to go to to figure out if they want to look at where can I find data about claims, where can I find data about these other topics. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is part of your data governance, and right. for me, this this is critical for any successful BI deployment. Um, and so while Microsoft had this product called Data Catalog, that's what I thought you were talking about. Um, but I think a, a data catalog, it's pertinent, it's relevant to any repository. I think that's what yeah, yeah. Ginger was just talking about because end users or even developers themselves, we need to know. And if we don't have this repository, how do we know, right? And that's how, that, I think not having a repository like that is what introduces data silos and repeated things across your organization. Because I go look at it and I go, oh, it's not there, so I need to create it, yeah. right? So I, I was, like I said, the company I was at before, 
The reason that doesn't exist is if it's you have to write it. So you have to tell people, this is where we put all the, the, the client information. If it's not there, then it doesn't exist. But you have to empower them to be able to go look at that. And what that means is you've got to write all that up yourself. So you've got to write the DAX, you've got to write the apps. You have to give people the ability to look for themselves. So my goal is to have nobody call me or ask me anything later. The only way to do that is to write it all down and then have it be in a place that's obvious. And to be honest, we found the easiest way to do that was to deploy it as a report in Power BI as text because they could find it. And everywhere else is like, ah, oh, I don't know where it is. So yeah, you have to write it down and then, and then follow the standards that you set and let everyone read it for themselves. Otherwise, they'll just call you. Or worse, do it themselves. And just speaking along the idea of like documentation and just collection of a lot of this stuff, uh, it can go into the idea that you, you want people to be able to access and know um, what data sets are being used, uh, user statistics, um, like what measures are being used across what models, like all, all of this metadata like from an admin level that um, that just helps you like maintain uh, almost like a, a constant audit of that. Um, I've actually like just uh, to, to, to drop a product, like the, the only thing that exists really that does this today um, is a tool called Power BI Sentinel um, that um, you might have seen a post that Chris Webb did about it. Um, um, it's uh, created by somebody, um, Alex Whittle, an MVP over in the UK, um, and it collects everything um, uh, in your tenant and uh, as an Active Directory tool, plugs right into it, and it's a great way to, to be able to just, from an admin level, uh, see your reports, your dashboards, your data lineage, all, all of the list of measures and columns. Um, it even lets you do version changes, so you can actually do um, version control between files and actually see what changes occur each time a, a, a publish happens in automatic backup. So it's not like a perfect catalog, um, but it's the, it's the best thing available today for that. And I've found that that saved me um, dozens of hours of having to do this myself because I will say that I hate doing documentation. It is so boring. And to have a tool you can just plug and they just print out this kind of stuff for you and just have it readily there for you without having to go to Visio and draw up the diagrams yourself is so convenient. So like that's one um, option I would recommend exploring for Power BI. Uh, Power BI Sentinel. Purple Frog is the, the company that makes it. So one thing I like to add to that is a lot of a lot of initiatives find themselves, hey, I want to build this. We need this. I want to build this, and they tend to go from the why do I want this to what do I want, but they never really explore the how. And the how part is where you're trying to figure out what is the tool, what data sets can I potentially use, right? They go straight to hey, what data do I need? Do I just go start grabbing that data instead of does it already exist? Is there already a process? Is there already a cube? Is there already a data flow? Is there already something out there that's been documented that I can leverage? Um, and that's, that's a part that's really lost in a lot of the processes out there that I've run across, is that they go straight from, hey, I need this, here's why I need this, all right, here's exactly what I gotta go get, versus, you know what, how do I go get that? Right? Is it imperative to build a process around that? Is it imperative to build documentation around that? Is it imperative to use something that's already established and follow the process? Or do I need to build new process? Because this is an exception that needs to be part of the rule now. Right? I'm Jeff Bandy, I'm from Tampa, Florida. I work for a government entity, and our upper management has decided we're going BI, but we're at the infancy stage and any type of government, we're in silos. And Patrick was mentioning silos in another presentation earlier. Well, right now, we're using SSIS packages to try to get our data from Excel spreadsheets or PDFs into our data lake. And it's painful, I know it's a process, I know we have to work through it, but we're only on-prem, and there's no plans to go to Azure. So are we gonna just be spinning our wheels or is that actually something that's capable of doing to be successful? Well, I can just take part of it. There's no reason that you have to go to um, the Power BI service in Azure to be successful. Um, that's not a requirement. What is a requirement is that you get your data in a way that it allows it to be reported on and queried um, in, in one central location. But you said you take data from PDFs and I just about did a twitch right there because that is, um, let's just say unusual, and we'll leave the rest of the adjectives off um, that I can think of. But 
you need to be able to centralize your data in a location. Um, as far as a data lake, I have had some experience with data lake and you're generally speaking from a performance perspective, if you have it in a relational structure, and we're talking on-prem here, um, there's some different options in the cloud, but you're, you're, you're not going there, so I'm not gonna talk about it. I wouldn't do any kind of an on-prem data lake that didn't contain structured data because your performance is gonna be terrible and nobody wants to wait 10 minutes for the report to show up. So figure out a way to, um, I will say that the most important thing and the thing that I help clients with the most that totally screws up their Power BI, including my existing client, is they need to understand, you need to understand what dimensional modeling is and how to do it. If you don't, if you have that right, then your reports will work. And then there's the converse. If you have that wrong, your reports will never work and they'll never do what you want them to do. So if you're, if you're starting out, start looking at dimensional modeling and figuring out how you can structure your data in that format. So you're actually in a good situation though. One of the greatest things about like just starting is that you haven't messed up yet, right? So, which, no seriously, so what you need to do before you start building anything, deciding on anything too, you need to build a roadmap, right? Because if I say let's go out and run, obviously I don't run, he does. But if I say let's go out and run, and you're like, sure, let's go, right? Am I running a mile or I'm running a marathon? That's a huge difference. If you don't know where you're going, you don't know, you know, you could end up wherever, right? So in your infancy, as you're starting to build stuff, you know, I know your source is some, you, that's a whole different issue. But if you don't know where you're going, then it doesn't matter what your source and stuff is because you're going to be a, a rudderless ship. So in your infancy, too, for you guys to, help to, to start out right now, you need to figure out where you're going and building a roadmap. So that would be the first thing I would do. What do we want to do? And then from there, you can work yourself back. Oh, okay, I need this. Okay, I need this. I can. Need, I need this, right? Because that's going to change depending on where you want to be in the long run. So. And I'll just piggyback off of that and, and pull it back into the idea of roles um, within this. Like you're at the, the stage that I mentioned where <clears throat> you're now just to the point where you're wanting to actually buy into Power BI. You're not testing it. Sounds like you're you are going to be shifting over to it. This is that stage where you want to bring on an actual architect, like somebody who can help you plan out that roadmap, under, help you understand which features are available so you know what to ask for, like the art of possible type things. Like th This will be the person to make sure that the data gets um, put in the right locations. Um, you have um, those core like golden data sets to be able to connect to, because um, you don't want to end up with more and more silos, like in, regardless of if you will continue to have to use Excel and PDFs to pull it in, you can still take all of that messy data, however, um, just dysfunctional and chaotic it might be, and you can still create like, master sets of data that are in SSAS or something on-prem, and then Power BI report server can just build right off of that. It doesn't have to be done in Power BI, it can still be done on-prem SQL, but you need that person to kind of help you make sure that those right decisions get made from the, from the get-go, because it will cost you a lot more money if you kind of stumble your way through it um, and try to you know, fix it a year or two later. Let's put it this way, there's an ideal way of doing things, the quote unquote right way, and then there's a way you have to do it based on the constraints that you have, right? And there's this thing about called time to market. There's this thing about skill set. There's this thing about tooling, right? You might be in a place where you know what, you're not allowed to use X tool. You can't do that as you're off the table, right? So with having an, uh, an architect come in and kind of talk to you a little bit about kind of like a guidance counselor, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? Right? That's what your organization's doing. I've got all this data, I want to collect it, I want these reports, but you know what? That's the immediate. It's like, hey, I want a Snickers, I want to go blow my money on a Snickers, but if I hold on, I can buy a whole box of Snickers later because I can do something else, right? So at this point, your organization, as mentioned before, I would recommend that you get a professional come in, talk about what your aspirations are as an organization, right? Hey, I want a Power BI. What does that mean? What does that look like? Here's desktops, free, you're done. Right? What does that definition of, uh, of success look like at this far end, this three, five year plan? Work your way backwards with the gaps. Now you apply the constraints and that's where you're gonna go. Right? Those are the tools you're gonna use. So whether SSIS using Excel, bringing it into a data warehouse, a data lake, a fuller structure, right? Those decisions would be better served once you understand where you're going and what are the constraints, right? It's easy to say, no, you should never do that. But you know what? There's always a reason for these exceptions. Now the question is, is are you, do you understand the consequences of those exceptions, right? When I decide to go an un-best-practice uh, route, what am I buying into? 
And at this point, it's not that you, that is the bad decision. That could be the best decision you have. But knowing and being aware that I just made this decision, it means it's going to cost me X to be able to get out of it later, and the business understands, and that's a risk we're willing to take on, then that's the best decision you got, and that is your solution. But without having those conversations and the perspective shifts that someone that has been around and seen things and done things and is aware of the various technologies out there, right, you will always be making this decision in a vacuum, and you'll find yourself in this position. I don't know how many organizations I've been to where, hey, we want to move from this tool to the next tool. And what do they do? One tool to rule them all, to another tool that rules them all, to yet another tool that rules them all. You know, there's this thing where C-level leadership changes every five years, right? That's the average, which means what usually comes along with them? New tooling and their friends, <laughs> right? So when you have that change, that stuff coming around, you need to make sure you have an architecture that is resilient enough to allow you to change with those forces and not be re-architecting, retooling, re-educating, and all this stuff. So the more you can identify where you want to be and what kinds of things you want to be able to address, the better your decision making will be today, even if it's worse practice. You at least know what you got. Hi, my name's Rachel, I'm from Santa Rosa, and um, my company's in the process of building out a roadmap, just like you've been talking about, and they're a very careful company, and we move a little bit slow, but uh, I think we make great decisions in the end, and we don't currently have any kind of intranet, and we have difficulties communicating. <laughs> so I'm wondering if we need to go, before we go into putting Power BI into a roadmap? Do we need to look at Teams, SharePoint, or are they all part of the same kind of roadmap? How, how is communication tied in with BI? How do you talk now? Right? Right now, you're having communications with people. Email. We're very e either in person, email, Slack, Teams, right? There, there's a variety of tools out there to provide communication. But what needs to happen, you need to come up with a method of being able to organize the work that you're trying to do. And this goes back, hey, I want to do this. Here's all the steps I got to accomplish. Here's the minor tasks and all the things that would be done. How are you tracking that? How is that workload distributed? How are you monitoring and managing that from a cost perspective, resource perspective? Do you have the right people? Those things are the things that I think need to be addressed. And then once you figure out what those requirements are, go find a tool. To your other point, though, I've worked at organizations that have, not very big ones, but people who um, did very successful BI implementations, did not have SharePoint, did not have Teams, did not use Slack. So it's not a requirement. I will say that it's, you know, it, it works better, it, and that works, I, that works in a place where it's small, but it's possible. Let's leave it at that. As long as you can talk to each other, somehow, some way. Hi, I'm Shuru. Uh, I work in a healthcare company out of in Columbus, Ohio. Um, hey. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of teams creating uh, uh, different versions of data sets, uh, but eventually using the same source data sets out of the warehouse. Uh, and we were kind of trying to look uh, what are the possible methods of creating centralized I would call the golden data sets uh, that we could utilize, so that way users are not creating same version, I mean multiple version of same data. Uh, and one of the options we were exploring was uh, through data flows. Uh, but as a being healthcare company, we are pretty much strict about what we're gonna put on the Power BI services. Uh, one of the examples would be personal health information of the users, I mean of the members. Uh, with the data flows, uh, we have explored there's high possibility of users bringing in uh, the PHI information uh, to, the, to the Power BI services. So I guess the question is, what are the measures that could be taken to resolve this issue? If we're, gonna, if we're planning to go with the route of using the data flows, if not, what are the other measures that we could be using? I, I, I heard a couple things there that are quite interesting. One of them is you need to control the proliferation of what seemingly sounds like duplicate data sets with maybe a minor difference of, hey, additional column or something got changed from a number to a descriptor or something like that. And then you also said something very interesting, a PII, right? How do you control that? 
And, and I think those are two completely different questions that may have a very similar solution, right? Um, a lot of times what you can do is you can, uh, to eliminate that is you establish data sets that are going to be your base data sets, whether it be in data flows or whether it be in the actual database engine, right? So let's say you're using SQL Server. If you're using SQL Server as your base database engine, you can have data flows pulling from a view or a materialized view or some kind of aggregate table or whatever it is you need, but it's done at the database layer. And from there, you can use data masking. From there, you can use other tools to manage the PII. And the question now is, is do these reports really need the PII information? Do you really need social security number? Do you really need name? Or do you only need some unique identifier to be able to provide a distinct count? And this goes back to shaping the data in a way that provides the analytics that they're looking for, not necessarily putting you at risk. Because at this point, you're talking about compliance, and there's risk of that. Anybody else? I'll hit at least on the the idea of um, like the when you would want to engage with golden data sets versus not, and like and that, that's one of those questions with a lot of these that like uh, where it comes to it depends. Like there's there's not always a right answer of yes these two these two data sets should be combined into a single shared data set or these should be kept separate, um, and you know it really. For me, the, the biggest factor that contributes to these is um, if you're adding stuff into this, um, how much com complexity in, um, in terms of performance and refresh time is actually being added to it? Because there's easy ways to do, you can hide the, the tables, columns, organizing the measures in folders, subfolders, and subfolders. And um, it's very easy to keep a, a model that has a lot of tables and measures still very clean and accessible for people. So if you're adding something in that maybe just you need one or two extra columns for, for uh, this table to be able to, to satisfy the needs for this report to be brought in, and that only adds marginal amount of refresh time, and as far as the, like your, any uh, performance testing that you're doing with the performance analyzer, if the model's not getting any uh, worse or slower, meaning maybe you're adding a column but not extra rows, that's totally fine um, in a lot of the scenarios to keep those and continually kind of um, keep a combined data set for that. But if you're starting to get extreme um, impacts where you know 18 reports are all gonna be slower just so you can add a 19th to this set, then that could be a good case where that might be uh, need to be a standalone report because there's a significant impact to it. Um, so it's you know no like concrete answer for any of that, but you know really think about that the biggest ones is refresh and performance. Um, like how much complexity is being added to either of those? Perspectives. If you're dealing with analysis services tabular, you can use perspectives to where you got a model that's got all the fields that everybody potentially needs. You got a perspective based on business unit, and now you've got isolation there. Um, keep in mind that. There's some caveats to that, but that's a way to be able to uh, slice the information to where it's visible to the individuals that are needing that information to where PII is actually available to those that need to see the PII. So to sum up what they all said about, about your situation, at the end of the day, it goes back to process, right? Pretty much everything goes back to process. So, you know, somebody says, oh, well, you know, we need this, but we need this extra column and stuff too. You need a process, some type of change management to go back and add it and change it back in there or to add, see, it still goes back to process. So that's all I want to add to that, so. Yeah. I work for city government. Our Bureau of Technology Services provides us with a, a full ESRI license, including insights. Um, wondering if there's a differentiator that makes it worth advocating for Power BI to spend the money on a license. So we have Esri Insights. We have a license already that's built into the budget. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah, we have yeah, we have a full Esri license. And is there a differentiator that makes it worth spending the extra for a Power BI license? At a corp at a enterprise level. Well, I won't knock Esri. Esri is a great tool, but Esri is designed to do a whole lot of stuff with geographic data. Um, I've never used Esri to create financials. So the question is, what kind of reports are you doing? If you're only doing geographic reports, then honestly, I think you'd find a hard time making an argument for Power BI. But um, most people want something other than geographic. So as she was saying too, like you know, if you're doing financial stuff, obviously that's a Power BI type of thing. But it's not, it doesn't have to be an either or because Esri with Power BI is amazing. Being able to bring your own shape files and stuff like that in too to be able to report and stuff and then have stuff from other things matched up with it, then it becomes like a match made in heaven. So it doesn't have to be an either or, but it depends on what you're doing with the reports, right? So that's one of the, that's, that's the 
I guess we're all consultants at the end of the day. That's why we keep saying it depends, right? But it does. But you know, don't think of it as an either or, right? Esri is a great tool when used with Power BI. It doesn't. Like it's, of course, right, the, the Power BI mapping is garbage. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. C yeah, yeah. I, I, can I jump in on this? Yeah, definitely. So I'm the PM on the Power BI team who's responsible for the relationship with Esri. So I know this area fairly well. Um, interestingly, their CTO for, uh, I forget exactly the name of the title, but he owns the Insights product, product as well as the Power BI integration. So um, they're actually really happy when people use the two together. Um, they, they, they work really closely with us. They're a really good partner of ours um, to make sure that that inter integration works well. Um, I think what they are trying to do is th they see that there are gaps in what they do with their insights tool on these kind of, when you're not working with geographic data. They, they don't aim to be a general purpose BI tool. Um, and that's why they partner with us. Otherwise, they wouldn't be interested, right? Um, Conversely, we are not a mapping cost, mapping company. Um, we're certainly not. We certainly don't have designs on being a GIS tool. Uh, we'll always look to other people, whether it's third parties or other teams around Microsoft, to, to provide mapping uh, for us. So I think I'm not even going to go as far as it depends. This will always be an, an a, a both scenario. You'll always end up with both um, to, to to provide all of those needs, whether it's just geographic or not. Um, yeah. Anyone else? We have eight minutes. Anyone else? Eight minutes. Yeah. Anyone got a question? Oh, go ahead. We got one over here. Yeah. I'm Jonathan. I work at um, at and uh, responsible for uh, BI and data architecture for uh, one department there. And we implemented Power BI about a year and a half ago. Um, and we did not have good processes in place. Um, so it's been, it's become chaos. Um, and I'm trying to push for getting a semantic layer put in place. Um, there just isn't much uh, dimensional modeling experience, expertise on the team outside of me. And um, you know I can't do everything. So but we're also looking for, um, no, we use SQL Server as the back end for Power BI. And I'm curious, are, are for a semantic layer, mm -hmm. are a lot of people going for uh, like a, a shared Power BI uh, data set, you know, da uh, like one big data model in Power BI? or um, standing up an, an Azure analysis services or, or on-prem um, you know, SSAS for that semantic layer. So I, I hate to keep saying it depends. I, I really do, but it, it honestly depends on what you're trying to accomplish because Power BI and analysis services, kind of the same thing um, behind the scenes. And so the, the first thing I honestly look at is data volumes, at least today. Um, we did announce larger data volumes in Power BI. Do you already have an analysis services license um, for SQL Server to run on premises? You know, because for me, it's always cost savings, right? And so if you already have analysis services, you already licensed it, build your semantic model, deploy it, live connect, you're ready to go. Um, if this is a new investment in Power BI, if you have premium, Power BI premium, you can have data models that are massive. Um, in your organizations, regardless of which path you take, right? You have to get control of the chaos that's going on in your organization through a central repository. I think we've talked about that a million times today. Once you once you get that down, then Power BI is a great tool to create a data model in. So the one thing that I talk about a lot is, and it just drives me bananas when someone creates a model and starts creating reports directly in the model that's created. Create your model, publish your model. Create your model, publish your model. Your model is hosted in Power BI. It's just a tabular model. And then you have your report developers connecting to that model, building their reports based on that model. Reed comes along and says he needs a new measure. I go to the model. I add the measure to the model, pub publish the model, refresh your report. The measure's there, right, instead of having all those. But the first thing you got to do is get, get a grapple on the, the chaos. Then once you get a grapple on the chaos, 
you know, going AS, going Power BI, you know, you, if there's a feature in AS that's not available into Power BI or vice versa, that could be the case for, but otherwise, I say go Power BI. Not, not that, don't insinuate anything from that, that AS is going away or anything like that, but you'll get all the latest features going Power BI. And if you do it in Power BI, you can just script it and publish it to analysis services later on. So, I mean, it's, I know, but, you know, it's, it's a nice way to do But, <laughs> no, but like what he's saying, though, at the end of the day, it still goes back to, you keep hearing this rehash this, whether, regardless of the question, at the end of the day, it goes back to the process, right? So, you know, figuring out where does, where does, you know, where does your company want to go to? Where do you want to be, right? And then getting a process. Because at the end of the day, BI is still a new feature. Right, and so you know everybody in some aspect is still growing and discovering it. Even people who've been doing it for 20 years, they're still discovering it because it's still a new part of IT. So at some way, everybody's still in some type of wild, wild west type of thing. So you know, build your th think. You know, don't 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 get dis disheartened because you know things are chaotic. Just step back and say, hey, you know what? Let's look and see what we have. Let's you know. So one of my favorite sketches from Saturn Live was to simmer down now, right? Simmer down now, right? Silly, so just just calm down and, and figure out where you are, right? Take a deep breath, step back. Sometimes you got to step back and see where you are, right? Because stuff, stuff becomes so chaotic, you can't see. You got to step back, but step back and figure out what's going on, create a process, and then go forth. It's okay if you stop for one month. You know, some people, oh, we can't, we got to keep going, got to keep going. That's probably going to fail. Sometimes you got to stop and step back and say, what's going on to be to move forward. So. I'll just give two cents on that, at least as far as, um, uh, and there, there's a lot of reasons already mentioned on why you might want to uh, do analysis services versus um, Power BI, but at least from a uh, handing the torch off perspective, I have actually found that I've personally leaned a bit more on um, developing just models in um, in the Power BI service, because uh, again, back end, they're both the bear to peck engine, they're both tabular models. More and more, um, like uh, Azure Analysis Services features are becoming available in Power BI, but the user interface is so much more streamlined and simple. So to hand that off to a developer who's not familiar with either system, um, there's a lot more training and um, sometimes even like just nervousness around um, having uh, somebody else like take off the complexity that is Azure versus just the simplicity of Power BI. So that's so much easier just to half on, just ha um, hand off to somebody, walk them through the three dozen things that they can um, set up and monitor and configure. So it's much easier to pass the torch in that environment today at least. So the inverse is that on the whole depend side, right? You've got this uh, model that you need built. Depends what you're going to use it. Power BI is going to be the only thing hitting it. Excel is going to be the only thing hitting it. All right, great, awesome. Go down Power BI. But if you've got this model and you've got an IT infrastructure and a business organization path that says business units, you pick whatever tool you want. You got Power BI, you got Tableau, you got some of these other things. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but you got some of these other things all out there. Guess what? Having a centralized semantic model that can allow you to facilitate that information to any tool and give you the same answer regardless of what tool can be very powerful. And that goes back to the architecture of what do you want to be when you grow up? I think we're done. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.